Good evening, welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like you to welcome you to Harborough's first webinar, where we're going to feature tonight a uh, focus on sheep and then particular topic. Uh, my name is David McKenzie and I work with the Beef and Sheep team at Harborough. And uh, tonight I'm hoping that we are going to uh, show you a, a, an enjoyable evening that we're going to focus with four excellent speakers on that sector of livestock. Now, let's hope that technology keeps together. It's uh, a, a unique thing for all of us these days working uh, in this type of technology, but the, the good point is that you only have to get half dressed when you're presenting. So, the format for tonight is that we will run through four speakers and each doing a presentation which will last for 10 minutes. At the end of the presentations, um, can you please send any questions that you have for any of the speakers in the private chat that you will see at the side of your, uh, the, the webcam, at, at the side of the, the technology. We will take that through and we will try to fit in as many questions as we can. If we have too many, what we'll do is we will come back to you individually with an answer, but we will we will do that at the end of, of tonight. Now, I'm going to introduce our, our four speakers tonight. We're, go we're going to run through, starting with Jill Hunter. And Jill, I'm going to introduce Jill. Jill's our uh, beef and sheep nutritionist. Jill works closely with it, with the team. Uh, not only on the training side, supporting on nutrition, and Jill will be well known to most people in Scotland, particularly in the sheep sector. Next we have, after Jill, we have Reg Jones. Reg uh, is based with Glasgow Vet School. Reg is currently working on a residential, pro a residential program that is a four-year program which will lead to a European diploma. That program is jointly with Harborough and Glasgow Vet School. And what that means is that Reg works very, very closely with our team, with our customers, and focusing on their data, which Reg is uh, actively working on currently right now. Next then we have Hannah McCarrow. Hannah is a vet. She is the MSD Veterinary Advisor, uh, a background in working with mixed practice. She's specializing in sheep health and medicine. And she is covering the advisory role for MSD, mainly in Scotland and, and covering Scotland and Northern England. After Hannah, we're passing then to Tom, Tom Slade. Tom is an agriculture consultant and Tom has worked extensively across the retail supplier base, along with his own farm and enterprise. Tom is based in the Midlands, England, and Tom has his own beef and sheep farm. And before Tom, uh, went full-time and doing that with, with some consultancy work. Tom was agricultural manager for Marks and Spencers. Tom also works with Harbro and supporting projects that we have uh, near the area where Tom's based. Please uh, enjoy, enjoy what you're going to hear and we will try and cater for as many questions as we possibly can at the end of Tom's presentation. I'd like to thank everyone for, for, for coming tonight and we really hope that you, you value what we're trying to do and you get some good experiences from it. With that, I'd like to pass on to Jill Hunter, please, to, to start tonight. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Davey. Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you this evening about is this concept of epigenetics. Okay, and what we're going to do is really essentially answer these two questions. We're going to answer what is epigenetics and how can sheep producers benefit from it? What we're going to do is we're going to go straight into a bit of a history lesson here. So at the end of World War II, <clears throat> just as the Germans retreated out of Holland, they, they burned the bridges and they destroyed the roads. And what this meant is that food supplies, gas and electricity all got cut off um, and the, the whole of Holland was left stranded. People's standards of living suffered dramatically as a consequence. And in November 1944, calories were reduced from about 1,000 to roughly 1,000 a day. By the, the following spring, April 1945, calories were almost halved to, to about 500. 
This picture here um, on the right hand side of the screen, this was was, was typical. Um, the children at the time, what they used to do was um, wonder, they would go about and they would, they would carry a spoon with them. And this was them just in case, just in case they came across any food, they would carry the spoon about with them. So what does 500 calories actually look like? 500 calories is about a nine ounce steak um, or it's not quite a whole Big Mac. So the people at the time, though, they, they, these people, they weren't eating sirloin steaks and they weren't eating Big Macs. Um, they were eating anything they could lay their hands off. And this was things like tulip bulbs. It was sugar beet. It was anything that they could get their hands on. Across that winter, there was almost 20,000 people died. So let's think about the consequences of this hunger winter. If we consider two siblings, one that was conceived um, before the hunger winter, so this was when diets were good, when calorie intakes were normal, and then a second sibling, same mother, same father, um, that was conceived during the hunger winter. So this is when their, their parents' diets were a, a low calorie intake and, and very poor. If we think then about the spring, the following spring, the, um, the Allied forces regain control in Holland um, and standard of living regain um, increased very quickly. So these two siblings were brought up exactly the same, their diets were the same um, thereafter. So the only difference was the nutrition at the point of conception. What we see actually is that the, the, the effect of this hunger winter went on and, and lasted um, for a, a long, long time. What we saw, um, so the Dutch keep very meticulous records and what this meant was that we could look and see how these babies that were conceived in that time were affected for the rest of their life. And what we saw is that sibling number one, so this is the one that was conceived before um, the hunger winter, they really, they um, recovered from the effect. They weren't really affected later in their life. Sibling number two, however, later in their life, they were they really were more set susceptible to ill health. They were, they were more likely to be obese, they had high blood pressure, they had heart disease, and they were more likely to be develop things like schizophrenia. So what this really shows us, and what we this is the, the, the key bit if you're thinking about epigenetics, is that um, nutrition and stress at the point of conception had an influence on us later in life. So if we pull that then back to sheep, that's what we're here, that's what we all want to know about is how does this affect sheep? So by understanding epigenetics and uh, by getting our nutrition and management right at the point of tupping, so the point of conception, the point of tupping, we can really influence which genes are switched on and which ones are switched off. And then we can, that ha then has the, the impact um, the, to enhance the overall lifetime performance of those lambs. So what I'm really saying is it doesn't matter how much harbour lamb feeder you feed later in life or when you're trying to finish the lambs, if you haven't actually turned on that genetic potential in the first place. So what do we think about nutritionally at top and time? There's three things that we need to think about. The first one's body condition scoring, okay? So if our users are too lean, um, they're not gonna have enough energy to cycle. If they're too fat, they're gonna be too lazy to cycle and they're not gonna come into estrus. So if you think about, um, most, most users will be um, Spain's now weaned, um, and probably the body condition score is about a two and a half. If she's worked quite hard, she'll be about a two and a half. We want her to be a three, a three and a half um, by the point of top end, depending on what type of use and the type of farm you have. So we've got to regain one whole body condition score. It's going to take us about 50 days on good quality grass. So that's something to bear in mind and to factor into your plans. The second thing we need to think about is feet. Okay, so we need the use and the tops to be mobile enough, to graze enough, to be able to regain that body condition. When we're thinking about feet as well, we shouldn't just be firefighting and solving issues. We should be thinking about it as a holistic approach um, and really how can supplementation help to, to maintain hoof health and, and prevent lame sheep. And then fertility, of course, fertility is important at tough and time. Um, we need to make sure that tops are in good order, their feet need to be right, their body condition needs to be right. All of that has to come together at one time. So if we think then about um, this time of year, um, especially this year, grass is very much is in plentiful supply. Um, and we're, we're supplying the, the sheep with enough energy, enough protein to be able to regain that 
that body condition without supplementing them with compound feed and um, with, with any sort of concentrate. But if we're not supplementing with anything, how do we support the feet? How do we um, improve fertility? How do we gain that positive epigenetic effect if we're not if we're not supplying any compound? And the answer really is quite simple. We can supplement with these harbor feet and fertility mineral buckets. Okay, feet and fertility mineral buckets. So when we give the ewes and the tubs feet and fertility buckets. We're not supplying them with energy and protein. We're simply giving them the supplementation of high quality ingredients that are really highly bioavailable for the animal to, to uptake. And what we see when we supplement using tops with feet and fertility is we see less lame sheep. We see an increase in our scanning percentage. We see more live lambs. And we see lambs that are more vigorous. You know, they get up and they suck and they get on with life. And if we're thinking about a positive epigenetic effect, thinking about that then we know that we're going to get better lifetime lamb performance. The other thing to remember is not to forget about the tops. Okay, so it's really important that we supplement the tops as well. Half the genetics of a lamb comes from the ewe and the other half from the top. So we must make sure that we're supplementing our ewes with feet and fertility. We're also giving it to the tops. It's really important that we do that at least three weeks before we put the tops with the ewes. So, um, the generation of sperm takes three weeks, 21 days, so we need to make sure that at least three weeks um, before we put the use of the top. But around 4p um, ahead a day, it really is, it's a very small investment um, in supplementation for that huge gain that there's there to, there to be had. So just to summarise, epigenetics is really simple, it's a switching on and off of performance genes at the point of tupping. And we can all adv take advantage of this epigenetic effect by investing in quality supplementation at the point of tupping for ewes and for tups, and that boosts overall lamb performance thereafter. Okay, so that's um, epigenetics in a nutshell, and there'll be time for, for some questions. I'm sure you've lots of questions after. Um, equally, email address if anybody wants to ask any questions um, individually, I'm fine with that as well. So I will just now pass on to Reg. Hello. I think that everybody can hear me. Um, so I'm going to give you a brief overview of benchmarking for health and production. And this is going to be done really looking at um, benchmarking uh, from weaning to tupping. So benchmarking in a nutshell is when you compare one thing to a standard. Now that standard could be um, an industry standard or it could be a local standard, something uh, like if you're part of a flock health club or a grazing group. It can also be uh, within farm. So we can benchmark against ourselves. Uh, therefore, we're looking at um, our benchmark over time from one year to another. So what do we benchmark? We benchmark uh, key performance indicators. And these are figures that we um, compare. They're usually objective, um, measurable numbers um, and they're associated usually with profitability and efficiency on farm. Um, we tend not to look at these um, alone, we tend to look at several, not look at a single one in isolation uh, and that's because if we only look at one we might get a very skewed uh, view of, um, of what we're seeing. Um, for example, and it's a bit of an extreme example, if we had a 200% scanning percentage um, and we didn't look at the weaning percentage but only had 120% weaning percentage, then you know we might be looking, thinking that we're doing very well, but in fact, overall, we're not doing as well as we thought. So initially, when we think about benchmarking a farm, we tend to choose um, between five and ten of these key perform performance indicators, which gives us a really good overview of what's going on. Um, and these are really just broad, broad um, strokes over the farm. If anything flags up from these kind of broad strokes, 
then we can easily specify and go into greater detail looking at um, anything that's flagged up or especially if we know that there is uh, already a problem then we could look at these um, KPIs in, in quite a bit of detail. I tend to break KPIs into kind of two groups. I tend to break them into production related. So these are things that I look at um, from a historical point of view. They happened over the last year and gives me an idea of what's going on over the last year on the farm. And the other ones tend to be both production and managemental. So you can use them as management tools um, and can use them then and there. So things like body condition score for um, nutrition and um, average daily gain um, of, of lambs to make kind of worming decisions would be to manage mental KPIs. It's also really important to consider who we're benchmarking against. Are, are we benchmarking against the top 10% of farmers in the country? Or, or should we really be looking at targeting uh, the average farmer in the country? And that really depends on where you are as, as a farm. You might be re doing really well in lamb growth and want to compare yourself to the top 10% but not so well in fertility and therefore would like to compare yourself to the average working towards that top 10 percent if we're always benchmarking against the best we tend um, to get disillusioned even if you're a farmer or a vet or, or whoever is involved the the really important thing from bench a benchmarking point of view is to compare yourself to yourself though we do need to see that general improvement over time uh, and the last thing about like overall benchmarking really important not to record anything for recording's sake if we are going to start um, taking note of numbers we really need to make sure that that's a useful number uh, and we're going to make uh, it's going to make a difference to our kind of management strategy so um between weaning and tupping is a really good time to start thinking about benchmarking um you tend to know all your big important numbers by then um and um you can kind of assess the success of the last kind of calendar year of, of the sheep. Um, I this on the left hand side of the slide here is a, a bit of an example of um, uh, some benchmarking that we do for some Harbro clients. Um, and what I tend to do on farm is to choose um, three to four really broad, big benchmarks. Um, to look at initially. So, so here, if I'm looking at lambs, I tend to choose um, total lambs sold per 100 ewes, um, total lambs weaned per 100 ewes, um, kilograms of lamb produced per ewe to the ram, and uh, total uh, money made per ewe to the ram as well. Now, uh, the reason I choose these three or uh, four in particular is because they ha give us a really good overview of both performance and finance um, and they give us a, a kind of an idea of what's happened pre and post weaning these four can be uh, figured out very quickly and very easily by just recording um, five things on farm which are on the screen there and if we're not happy then obviously we would start looking at um, the other benchmarks that are related to land production in, in a bit of a greater detail so, as we said in the previous slide, really good time of year to start looking at, at benchmarking uh, and especially to start looking at your year end benchmarks or, or KPIs for um, use. Um, so uh, at this time of year, we will know how many use went to the top last year and we will also know how many use um, we intend to put to the top this year. And we can figure out um, the difference, how many ewes that we actually had to buy in or, or keep um, to make up that number. Uh, and this gives us our ewe replacement rate, rate, which is usually sits between about 20 to 25 percent, depending on where you farm um, and what kind of system you've got. It's a really good broad view, this, but it, it does need to look, be looked at in, in a bit uh, a more detail. Um, because 20% by itself looks normal, but it could be hiding a lot of other figures. So I tend to look at it in a great detail by looking at kind of voluntary contributory factors. This is um, our culling decisions. So things like um, I don't tend to keep use over four crops. 
um, I, I'm currently changing my breed, so I'm culling ewes of a specific breed, or that you had disease, so I chose to cull her, um, which is our culling rate. And the other thing that can um, influence our ewe replacement rate is our kind of involuntary contributory factors. And these would be the ewes that have got rid of themselves, really, our, our kind of mortality rate. Now, we should really look at the proportion of the voluntary and involuntary culling ratio. So how much of our release replacement rate is due to the voluntary culling and how much is due to the involuntary culling. So, for instance, if all our replacement rate is due to voluntary culling, um, then we would have very low mortality rates, which is great. But then we would we would start thinking, well, why are we culling so many? Is there an underlying reason? And this then points us towards really um, recording why we cull animals. Are we culling 20% of our flock for mastitis? Are we culling 20% of our flock because they're thin or because they're lame? You know, these are things that we can then build upon to improve over time. Conversely, if uh, our replacement rate is mainly made up of our involuntary culling, our, our mortality rate, then this should also be investigated. And it is really important that we start or try at least to record why a, a ewe has died or, or a sheep has died in, in as much as we can. Um, sudden deaths being a, a kind of um, over, overview tag for um, deaths. Um, right. So it's really important that whatever we look at in the use, our um, replacement rate, for instance, it is also looked at in the rams. You know, our rams are, are quite uh, an investment usually, uh, and they should um, be contributing 50% of the genetics, as Jill said, but, but they should be contributing as much um, to the flock uh, as the ewes are. So... Um, conversely, on the other side of the coin, we can also look at our pre-tapping managemental targets or our managemental KPIs um, as well. Um, and these can be used uh, as we are collecting them to make kind of management decisions then and there. But it's also important to record them and look at trends over time. This time of year, body condition score is, is the best example, uh, with body condition score, in my opinion, being the most important indicator of future performance at tapping and arguably um, the most important indicator of performance throughout the year. Obviously, ewes will have worked very hard coming up to weaning, and they might be down at a body condition score of 2 or, or 2.5, and so they require some time to recover pre-tapping so they're at the optimal body condition score of about 3.5 to 2.5. Ideally we would be weaning about 10 weeks before we intend to put the use back to the top um, and body condition scoring at weaning um, allows us to kind of decide to feed accordingly. Um, what we tend to see if we get the body conditions that go wrong at tapping are um, delays in the onset of breeding, uh, a reduction in ovulation rate, a reduction in conception rate uh, and also we see a, a reduction in embryo survival if the body condition score is low whereas if the body condition score is high we all we see a reduction in consumption rate again and, and a reduction in embryo survival as well we can also use body condition score to um, make our kind of flushing decisions um, use that are, have a higher body condition score tend not to respond to flushing as well as ewes that are at the lower end of the body condition score. So if grass is short, not like this year, but if grass is short, then we can prioritize our, um, our ewes that are of a lower body condition score. It is also important to note that body condition score is a really good indicator of disease. So if we are seeing quite a few ewes of a poor body condition score, we should be looking at our fluke our worms, our um, iceberg diseases, our urinis, our AP, OPA, our, our mighty business. And lastly, we'll discuss URAM ratio. It's, it's a funny thing is URAM ratio. It, it varies really widely depending on where you are in the country with um, HDB reports of about 50 U's per RAM and QMS reports of um, as little as 30 U's per RAM. So it's um, influenced by uh, geography and the terrain that you've got to farm. But 
anything between there it, it is about the right ratio. So that was a really quick view of, of what benchmarking can offer, um, and especially at this time of year. Um, I'm going to pass on to Hannah now because I've gone over my time and she's going to discuss some um, lameness issues with you. Perfect, thank you. Hopefully everyone can hear me all right. So I'm going to talk about how we can try and stamp out lameness within the sheep flock. So we know that in the sheep flock, lameness is a massive welfare concern, but it's not just a massive welfare concern. It can have a massive impact on farm product profitability. So if we've got a yow that's lame, she's going to potentially be eating less, which can then cause twin lamb disease, reduce fertility, poor milk production. For our lambs, they can have a delay to finishing if they're not eating as much due to lameness. And even if we do get them to finishing, they can potentially be unfit to travel if they're if they're lame and painful. For yourselves, from a farmer point of view, we're going to have increased costs associated with feed and medication, increased time and labour to treat these animals, and also the welfare implications, not just for the sheep, but also for your farm assurance schemes and things like that. So there's a lot of figures and it's quite difficult to estimate the cost of lameness on farm. But the cost of lameness per affected Joe, based on this independent consultancy on rural affairs, has been estimated at £89.80 per affected Joe. So fairly significant impact on the bottom line. So the main causes of lameness, if we're going to try and reduce lameness, then we need to know first of all what's causing it. In no particular order, the three infectious causes of lameness within the UK are contagious ovine digital dermatitis, or COD, scald and foot rot. The non-infectious causes are toe granuloma and celly hoof. So I'm going to discuss these in a little bit more detail. So COD is is caused by a bacteria. It's relatively new, so it was first seen in the UK in the 1990s, and we don't really know where it came from initially. It is estimated to be present on around 20% of farms, so quite significant. And it can quite often be complicated with a mixed infection with foot rot. So on its own, cod doesn't tend to cause a smell, but we'll get this lesion that's seen at the top, so between the, the skin and the hoof junction. And the lesion will progress down the hoof wall, and we can actually end up with that whole hoof capsule coming off, so it can, can be pretty nasty. It's seen at any time of year, and in a naive flock where you bring it in from a new animal, it can affect up to 40% of your flock within the first year. So quarantining and trying to stop it coming in is really key in trying to control cod. Scald, if we look at scald, it's caused by the same bacteria that causes foot rot. It's actually an earlier stage of foot rot, and it's characterised by this inflammation of the skin between the toes. So we get hair loss, we get this moist, oozy lesion that's seen. It thrives in wet, damp conditions. So we'll quite often see it lambs in spring when they're grazing long, wet, lush grass, or in the that are housed in damp bedding. Those are the key key areas that we'll see it. And as I said, it's, it's an earlier stage of foot rot. So by helping to control foot rot, we're also going to control scald on farm. And control of scald can be by antibiotic sprays if we've got small numbers, foot bathing, which I'll talk a little bit more about, and liming. So lime has a really good antibacterial property. So it's quite good in areas that are poached a lot, say gateways or feeders. And making sure that we're keeping feet as dry as possible. So making sure we've got plenty of bedding in the lambing shed, etc. So foot bathing, if it's not done properly, is probably worse than not doing it at all. Um, so trying to choose a dry day if possible. Running sheep through a, a clean bath of water first to make sure the feet are really nice and clean. If we're using 10% zinc sulfate, that they're standing in it for 15 to 20 minutes to allow contact time. If we're using 3% formalin and copper sulfate, they're walking through it steadily. And then letting them stand on a nice dry, clean surface before they're turned out to fresh, dry, clean pasture. And foot rot is our, our third infectious cause of lameness, and it's actually the most common cause of lameness. So it's present on at least 90% of farms and accounts for a massive percentage of lameness seen within the UK. 
It's caused by the same bacteria that cause scald. So they first of all damage that skin and then they penetrate deeper and cause foot rot. And infected sheep will carry the bacteria, so it can be a source of infection for the rest of your flock. It's caused by this bacteria, and there's 10 strains within the UK. Different strains have different virulence, but they basically produce chemicals that break down that hoof wall. And the more virulent strains have stronger chemicals that they produce. We tend to see it in autumn and spring, spring so say tupping time, it will be quite often be causing lameness in a lot of flocks. It survives up to 10 days on pasture, and we see it as this under running off the sole and hoof wall. So where cod was coming from the top and going down the way, foot rot tends to come from the bottom and go up the way. And we'll get this really characteristic smell, it stinks. And it is infectious, so we'll get these infected sheep coming into the flock, and then they'll be a source of infection for the rest of your flock. So a complete approach is recommended. We need to really incorporate the whole flock when we're thinking about controlling foot rot. And actually, we'll quite often have different stages of the disease within, within the flock. So we might have some that are harbouring the bacteria, they're harbouring the infection, but they're not actually lame yet. So we've thought about what might be causing it. We then can think about what we can do about it. So this five point plan is quite widely accepted as a very good way to try and control lameness on farm. And really to get the best results, we need to be incorporating as many of the five points, all of them really, if we can. So culling badly or repeatedly affected animals, avoiding the spread of infection at gathering and handling, treating clinical cases early, quarantining incoming animals and vaccinating to stimulate immunity. So we think about culling badly or repeatedly affected animals, we're really talking about two strikes and you're out. So that's not two treatments per infection, that's two bouts of foot rot really per season to try and help prevent that cycle of infection. A lot of farms, I appreciate this is not going to be practical culling at this level, but it will take a bit longer to get on top of lameness if we're not implementing this stage. So it is a bit, this stage, a bit individual farm circumstances, but trying to be as strict as we can about this will help to reduce on farm prevalence. The second important bit is trying to avoid infection. So we try, want to try and minimise spread at gathering and handling. So we're running all our sheep through one area. We want to minimise the spread to them. So clean, well-drained handling areas as much as possible. Dirty concrete is just as bad as, as dirty soil. So making sure that it is really clean and um, potentially spreading lime. As I said, it's really good for antibacterial, but just trying to be as, as clean um, and minimise poaching. Treating clinical cases early, so this normally does mean using some antibiotics, sprays for scald because we're just treating that surface. Scald is not actually when it penetrates the foot, so we can use antibiotic sprays. Foot rot, as we discussed, is when it goes that bit deeper, so we tend to need injectables. But we really want to be trying to move away from only treating, and the five-point plan is really focused around prevention. Foot trimming is a bit of a contentious subject. Um, uh, as a treatment, no. There's a lot of studies and a lot of evidence that it really delays healing, and you're also just risking spreading that infection to the rest of your flock. Routine tri trimming for overgrowing foot shouldn't really need, be needed because of the normal seasonal pattern of wear and tear, but if, if they are overgrowing, we can trim, but trying really not to use it as a treatment, it is very much contraindicated there. Quarantining incoming animals, try and minimise what comes into your flock. This is true, not just for lameness, um, but four weeks after purchase, keeping stock separate, running them through a foot bath and monitoring, and buying from a source that's really paying attention to, to lameness. And the fifth point is vaccinating to stimulate immunity. So vaccine needs to be incorporated as far, part of this five point plan, not just viewed solely on its own. But it's part of a whole flock approach. It helps encourage immunity within the um, flock and that will help improve your success in the other four steps. How often you need to vaccinate after your sheep have had the primary course will slightly vary depending on your on farm lameness. But if you know we're continuously buying in stock, considering twice your vaccines if we're having a lot of infectious pressure on farm. 
So, as I said, foot rot is infectious. Sheep don't have an immunity to the bacteria that causes foot rot. So the, the reason that we vaccinate is to try and help stop the spread of the disease. If we've got these nice green vaccinated sheep and we buy an infected sheep or, or sheep is infected, they're, they're going to be protected from harbouring the infection. So Fitvax is the UK's only foot rot vaccination and it covers all 10 strains that I discussed. Um, it can help treat and prevent. The primary course is two one mil injections under the skin, six weeks apart, a booster six monthly, and then annual boosters may be sufficient once we've got the lameness down to a lower level, incorporating vaccine with the five point plan. Timing needs to be four weeks before risk periods um, and not six weeks prior to, to shearing. We know that it does cause lumps at vac the vaccine site because it is an oil-based vaccine, so it is a bit irritant. But if we're using steadymatic guns, taking our time and making sure our vaccination technique is really good, that shouldn't result in abscesses. Remembering other causes of lameness that I discussed as well, if you're really not getting on top of it, discuss that. It might be that actually we've got cod on farm. So that was a, a very quick whistle stop tour of lameness, but I think the major take home messages are that it is a major welfare and economic problem lameness, but it's important to know before we try and prevent it or treat it, what is actually causing lameness on your farm. Foot rot is obviously the most common cause and implementing the five point plan can really significantly reduce your lameness problems on farm. So I will now pass over to Tom, hopefully he is there and ready to take over. Thanks, Hannah. Much appreciated. So I'm going to take it from a different aspect now, looking at the whole supply chain. So going away from the farm um, and looking at over the, all the way through from, from the farm all the way through to the retail um, point of view. Um, so looking at it in, 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 in depth in a, in a different area. So the first point I want to talk about is actually knowing your customer. When we talk about supply chain, um, it's looking at it for end to end. So as a producer, Lots of producers think that uh, processes the customer, processes from a retailer point of view. But ultimately, the person who is eating that product, the end consumer, is the customer that we all need to think about in the decisions that we make throughout the supply chain. So just have that in your mind in terms of the end consumer is the customer that we need to be reactive to and that is constantly changing. So we need to be reactive in terms of what they want, what they ask for um, over a period of time. So that's what I'm going to go through uh, over the next few slides. With that customer the, customer, the customer world is changing. Google, mobile phones, internet banking is changing un unbelievably quickly in terms of how we are adapting technology and how we are shopping, how we are ordering food, how we are visually seeing food. Um, for instance, there are 2 million Google searches every second, 57 websites created every second, 85 number of times the average user checks their smartphone daily. It is everything at the fingertips the whole time. Information in terms of what is out there, in terms of actual product, in terms of supply chain, it is there at everyone's fingertips. So it's it's a it's a constantly evolving world that we need to be keeping up with. Um, that I'll go on to um, on the next slide in terms of where the customers' trends are changing so much. What I thought I'd do here is just just try a bit of a perspective in terms of 1980 to 2020, and just show how the world has changed so much. So if you look at it from a vehicle technology point of view, 1980, British Leyland, a great um, British company um, producing uh, lots of cars within the UK. You look at the 2020 now in terms of how we are changing electric cars, Tesla dominating the world in, in terms of electric cars and uh, battery power. Then we go into food in terms of Wimpy versus McDonald's in terms of how this actually changed and how the, the consumer has changed these businesses beyond recognition. Then you go on to computers. Look at 1980, the type of computer we've got there to where we are now. Lots of computers, actually, again, we talk about mobile phones. Lots of it's on smartphone. That's where we are actually using the technology um, instead of a, a large computer, as you can see from 1980. Then you go on to photography. Kodak, Kodak, a business, 1980, all about photos. Apple come along, actually revolutionized um, photography in a way. Not many people have photos, um, cameras anymore. It's all done by the mobile phone. 
Then coming on into agriculture in terms of look at the, the old Fords there in terms of the, uh, I think they're a, a 7.6, something like that, versus a, a Fent in terms of, oh yeah, the technology is moving. The customer, what the customer wants, what the customer wants that product to do is changing beyond recognition. Then in terms of how actually people shopping, just coming on to in terms of the land market, look at QuickSave, where we were in 1980 to now where we are in terms of 2020, Amazon. Everybody is wanting to do everything through Amazon. Even so much so in London, if you order a slot now, it'll be delivered within an hour. It's so live and so at people's fingertips. And actually what's driving this change? So I put down here six key areas that is driving this change. So one there is the health agenda. People are so, so conscious about that in terms of their health, what they are eating on a regular basis, and ultimately what they're feeding the kids, which is uh, having an impact in terms of the shopping basket and actually what they want from that product going forward. The other one in terms of environment, they want to ensure that people are working with the environment when they are buying their products. Technology, it's about technology, it's about data, it's about the technology to actually improve um, systems, whether it be a, a EID reader, whether it be um, uh, software to show where, where the lambs and the tups and a use are. Then you go into legislation, whether that be national legislation, whether it be from a farm insurance point of view or actually where it's from a from an NGO pressure. Legislation is changing beyond recognition, um, which is ultimately is changing how we are, are farming as, as, as farmers. And ultimately, that's how as how retail as customers are seeing the product. Come on to the middle one in there in terms of price. Price is always there in terms of what's trend changing. People are wanting value for money. There's a, a plethora of supermarkets out there that are offering different products at different prices but ultimately lots of people are still shopping on price but ultimately they want that value for money when they're buying that product the last one i know at the bottom right hand corner there is ethical they want to ensure that they are buying a product that is ethically sourced that is looking after the people and then ultimately is looking after the environment and looking after the whole kind of the holistic approach to a product um, that's really high up on people's agenda at the moment and there are some quite big um a green investors out there who are looking and who are just investing in ethical businesses or ethical supply chains to make sure that they are delivering for the customer going forward. Then just in terms of the, the actual changing marketplace, I just thought I'd bring it back to lamb in terms of, I tried to get 1980, but I couldn't, the, the data is not, not out there in terms of looking 2006 to 2020, where are we, some of the figures there, in terms of some of the kill numbers in, in 20, 2006, 14 and a half million versus 13.1 million now. Consumption, this is, a, this is a big one here in terms of consumption. 54 grams per person per week in 2006. 2020, 36 grams per person per week. Farm price, three, three pounds 16, 460 last week as I, as I looked. Average retail price across the country, quite different in terms of 587 versus 887. In terms of the actual retailers where we're purchasing the products from is changing beyond recognition. So obviously the, on the left, other big, four big supermarkets, actually on the right hand side is changing in terms of Ocado, Amazon, it's online, which comes on to the next two points, which are really, really big numbers and just trying to understand the consumer, how they're changing and how we actually meet those consumers needs. So if you look from an online grocery market in 2006, it was worth 120 million. 2020, it's worth 16.8 billion now. And that's set to grow after the last six months in terms of under COVID um, issues, they're thinking it's gonna grow another 41% over the next five years. That's colossal growth. And that's actually changing how retailers and how customers are purchasing going, going forward. Just wanted to bring it back in terms of actually meat production by livestock types. So when we talk about actually increasing lamb consumption, just in, 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 in production. Just wanted to give a little snapshot here in terms of the growth over the last 40, 50 years in terms of actually meat production. So the, green, the, the blue figure, poultry, growing massively throughout the world over, the last, over that period. Pig meat, again, consuming on, on, on an upward trajectory. Sheep and goat meat, sheep, it's under goat meat in there as well. It's under sheep and goat meat, the, the second uh, one down in terms of green. It's growing, but in such a smaller, um, smaller volumes compared to the other two so when i talk we talk about consumers what they're buying when they go to the shelf actually lamb producers are up against pig meat in terms of poultry in terms of potential versatility in terms of health benefits and potentially in terms of some of the, the, the cost perceptions of those products so when people talk to me about what people are buying it's ultimately we are competing potentially against those other 
uh, proteins for market share. And that's in terms of why, how we need to be reactive back to the customer and ensure the supply chain is in the right place. So just coming on to in terms of the changing environment, obviously the world around us is changing massively. There's so much more uncertainty, whether it be Brexit, whether it be elections, whether it be um, COVID, um, that is changing everything we're doing in such a short period of time. So that is obviously changing the retail market. The retail market in the last six months has changed beyond recognition in terms of how we are shopping, in terms of the time we're spending, the food we're getting, and actually how we are actually ordering that food and buying that food. Technology is driving that in terms of actually slots and how we can uh, buy online in terms of the time of deliveries and ultimately the cost is changing that as well. Then just linking that into how the actual food market is evolving. So competition is evolving massively. Everybody's trying to be special and different. They are trying to get people into their supermarket across the road from one supermarket to the other supermarket. So there's an ongoing pressure to be special, different, whether it be a dine-in, dine-in for two from uh, certain retailers, whether it be wine promotions, whether it be uh, three for ten on meat. Um, there's always that pressure to try and be different um, on, on certain products to get people through the door. There's the ongoing bit of food price inflation that will be there going forward in terms of where people are. One of the drivers is about price from a, a price perception point of view. But with all this in terms of the food market, the retailers are still wanting to maintain standards um, from an animal welfare point of view and um, from a supply chain aspect. So that how the retail of the world is changing um, over the last year to two years. That has changed in terms of the retailer commitments, especially from a sheep point of view, from a lamb point of view. So on the left hand side, you can see where retailers have gone to 100 uh, percent British commitment. Um, so the five five retailers have put there um, have made 100 percent British, British retail commitment um, throughout the year. Now, on the right hand side, there are commitments there to source in season, but there are still issues in terms of out of season having mixed origins. Just to put it in perspective, the four retailers on the right make up 60 percent of the market share of retail um, at the moment. Now, actually, if, if those four retailers turned around and said, yes, we'd like to go British all year round, there physically wouldn't be enough lambs at certain times of the year to supply that. So as a supply chain, we have to be conscious in terms of what commitments people are making and what commitments we can fill, fill us within the supply chain and ultimately to the customer. So just going on to the key uh, drivers to delivering long term supply chain. So just kind of three key areas to span a little bit here in terms of security supply, brand protection and then product differentiation and innovation. So in terms of security supply, right with raw materials, the right volume and the right spec. So this comes back to helping with the um, commitments but from a retailer point of view, British commitment, February, March, April, seasonality is not much lamb about. Um, they're finding it hard to actually uh, meet those commitments. So it's understanding what can be done potentially to help the retailers deliver those commitments on an ongoing basis to make sure British lamb is on the shelf. Comes back to British sourcing throughout the season for those customers, other other retailers, the ones on the right actually in season and committing to that, whether it's in season and there is a plethora of animals about to actually be able to use it and put it on the shelf. The other key drive to a long term sustainable supply chain is, is, is having a secure supply chain going forward. And this is one area that I think that work, more work needs to be done throughout the whole supply chain in terms of long term relationships, uh, robust commitments in terms of what is actually um, what is going to be procured at what time of the year um, and to give the people commitment. It's a, takes, it's a year to grow um, the, the, the product. So there needs to be some kind of commitment in there to have a robust supply chain, which needs to be worked on going forward so with all partners. So then coming on to brand protection. It's about integrity. It's about ethics and working with the right partners. There's the ongoing um, work in terms of environmental compliance, which is a given now. Um, but here's a key area, I think, from a, a sheep industry point of view, it's shouting more about in terms of the environmental credentials. Welfare standards, again, it's about shouting about those welfare standards that customers are expecting now. Um, and there are, they're, they're asking and they're wanting us to expand on and to be more transparent about. The ongoing work in terms of other areas, in terms of antibiotic reduction. And it's, again, it's about the transparency of antibiotic reduction um, and talking about the work that the industry is doing to reduce um, usage um, across the flock. Then the last one there in terms of feed sustainability, I'll talk a little bit about that. that that's a, an issue more and more coming into the ruminant sector, especially for areas like um, soya in terms of soya sustainability um, and soya sourcing and where it's actually sourced from. 
And then come on to the last one in terms of product differentiation innovation. This is about consistent quality. So it's about texture, it's about flavor. It's about delivering for the customer and making sure that they are not disappointed when they're buying that product week in, week out. Because if sometimes if they don't, if, it, if it's not delivered and then it's not consistent, potentially it's gonna take quite a long time for them to come back and ultimately they're a lamb customer. And potentially that's, that's where they're gonna to go to fish or to um, pig meat or to, or to poultry. So then just going further on down the supply chain, uh, in terms of, uh, from a process to retailer point of view, in terms of areas that they're really looking for um, and, and they're working on uh, at the moment to ensure that robust um, supply chain throughout the, um, the chain. So a little, lots of um, processes are working on factory efficiencies, ensuring the animals are, are killed in the correct procedure, um, have the right have the technology in the factory from a throughput point of view. Um, that alongside external technical and food safety standards, which is a given, retailers are not going away from having some of the highest technical standards um, within Europe and within the world in terms of from a food safety aspect. Constantly driving innovation, wanting that next product and that special and different. What can they have in that retail environment to make people come through that door, whether it be a breed, whether it be something like uh, salt marsh lamb or whether it be um, some other type of lamb that has been um, in a in a source or um, has got a, a, maybe a dry age. That's kind of the innovation that's driving customers and driving customers back into lamb and keep people buying and actually keeping them inspired. Alongside that, it's about being price competitive in terms of competing against other proteins. Um, understanding the consumer is really important from a retailer point of view, from a processor point of view, and from a farmer point of view. If we don't get that right, we're not delivering for the customer. We aren't, we aren't fulfilling the potential of the supply chain and ultimately of the industry. Um, just coming further on down in terms of long-term working relationships, but ultimately to drive that, it's about use of data to drive change and feedback down the supply chain from each party and using that data to try and drive change and drive innovation and drive a more sustainable uh, working environment for, for each party down the supply chain. And also, last area in terms of this, in terms of how it actually affects farmers as ourselves. So ultimately, it's, it's working about in terms of the kind of three key areas I put here is efficiencies, kind of ethical in terms of what's right in terms of from a people point of view and from an environment point of view. We've got to work with the evolving national and retailer standards. They are evolving. They are evolving to uh, obviously legislation and to consumer needs. We do need to be consumer aware. I would say this is a new era of agriculture with more transparency than ever before. So it's selling ourselves an industry, selling the transparency, selling what we're doing, and making people inspired and buying lamb as a product. There is the ongoing political upheaval in terms of Brexit will be uh, will continued uh, volatility, but on the flip side, uh, it brings potential um, um, opportunities in terms of from an export market. Um, to be able to do this, obviously we need to establish good supply chain links and build long-term relationships throughout the um, it's about the industry and it's about having those, having a very open relationship and having uh, integrity at each supply, each point of the supply chain to be able to build those long term relationships. That's really one of the key areas I want to take home is actually if we're doing what we're doing in 1980 or even 2006, is that the right thing? Are we putting the tops in at the right time or at the wrong time to make sure that the lambs potentially are fulfilling their potential later on down the line, whether it be from a price point of view or actually from a retailer? from a customer demand point of view. So seasonal supply is key to fulfilling 100% British commitments from the retailers um, that have actually put those pledges out there. Um, so it's, it's, the customer is constantly changing. So it's looking at your farm and what you're doing. And actually, is it right to optimize your business whilst meeting what the customer wants? So that's kind of my key take home message at the moment. So just a little snapshot in terms of the changing supply chain um, that we're work, currently working with. Um, and on that note, I will, that's the last presentation, um, and I'd now like to hand back over to David, who will um, lead some questions from yourselves. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Um, we now have uh, 10 minutes for questions, but first I'd like to thank all four uh, speakers. I think uh, and excellent presentations by all and uh, we're very fortunate to have quite a number of questions actually have come in um now we will restrict it to 10 minutes so i will if you can can you try and keep your answers brief so that we can get as many in as we possibly can okay now 
First one, um, Tom, how important is carbon emissions and land production with, re with retailers? And where do you see this in the future? I would say this is really important that retailers are looking at carbon as a, um, as a, as a supply chain point of view. They're looking to do uh, snapshots in terms of current uh, supply chains, whether it be uh, lamb, beef, pork, chicken, just to understand exactly where, where they are and what that impact that animal has or that supply chain has on, um, on the product. Really, really important. Customers are talking about it. Um, it's going to come higher and higher up, up the agenda. Um, and I think as an industry, we need to be more about it, being proactive, saying what our carbon footprint is or doing more work as an industry to say um, the different levels of carbon footprinting across different systems across the country. OK, thank, thank you, Tom. Uh, second question for Reg. Reg, you had lots of information and KPIs uh, in your presentation. For, for a start, what would be the two key areas that you would focus on if you've never entered into this type of benchmarking type approach before? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, it, I would I'd probably want one that looks at my use and one that looks at my, at my lambs. So I'd want one that looks at my lamb output and one that looks at my performance of use. So something like number of lambs sold per use to the top or, or kilograms of lambs sold per use to the top would be a, a fairly good one because um, you're combining both there. Um, and then something fertility-esque um, and that might be uh, a very easy one, which is your scanning percentage or, or your lambing percentage. Okay, okay, uh, thank you. Hannah, why is foot rot a bigger problem at top in time? It just tends to be when when we see it more, uh, potentially the, the scald maybe has, has really taken hold and progressed into foot rot at that time. I don't think there's any particular reason. It just tends to be when when we quite often see it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jill. Um, been asked, what are the ingredients in feet and fertility? Okay, it's a really good question. Um, feet and fertility was um, it was a kind of an amalgamation of, of a couple of products, and um, Professor John Robinson, who um, a lot of you will know he was well known from working at the the Rowett Institute um, and, and very well respected. He was heavily involved in um, developing the bucket. So th the basis of the bucket is is a molasses based bucket. So um, there, there's a good amount of sugar in there, but we're not really feeding it for the sugar. We're feeding um, the molasses as a carrier for the supplementation. So all the things that that John wanted to be in there. It's the um, it's the omega-3 oils, um, it's the, the highly bioavailable um, selenium in the form of cellplex, it's the, the zinc and the biotin for the feet, it's um, all the bits and pieces that we've got in there for fertility, the, the, the vitamin E, the cobalt, the choline, um, all these sorts of things to, to be carried um, carried by that. So there's, there's a combination of, of lots of different things um, in there. Okay, okay. Thank you, Jill. Um, a question I'll, I'll direct to uh, Tom. What do you feel farmers can do to improve their market? Um, I would say ensuring the right spec at the right time for the processor. Simple as that. Okay. That's Yeah, probably too short, but that's, I think, two key areas. Okay, Reg, question for you. Earlier weaning of lambs. Is it better for using lambs? What do you think? I think weaning shouldn't be a, a one-stop shop. We shouldn't be weaning the same day every year. We should be looking at it um, quite holistically. So in some cases, yes, early weaning of lambs might be the best idea uh, because there might be competition between lambs and use for grass or use might be very thin and we need to give them a, a bit of a help um, to put weight on before tupping. So it, it's a... The answer is, is a moving feast, I'm afraid. It really depends on what you're seeing in your in your sheep that year. Okay. Uh, a very, very straightforward one for you, Jill. Are Harbour products available in Northern Ireland? Yes. Thank you. I couldn't get a shorter answer than that, Jill. Well done. Um, another question that's come in. 
Lameness. Why is lameness so bad this year? Hannah, do you want to give um, do you want to give a, an opinion on that? I guess it depends slightly on weather weather wise as well. You know, if we've had a lot of a lot of rain, particularly in wherever um, this question was coming from, the wetter areas, we know that's a nice breeding ground for bacteria, poached ground, that kind of thing is gonna potentially transmit bacteria a lot easier. So that will have a lot a lot to do with it as well. Okay. And is there anything that you would say that you're seeing that it continually changes or is it uh, just you're finding, how, how do you record if it's worse or better in certain years? I guess it, it's dependent on, on individual vets kind of or farmers going through it and recording different, different lameness. I guess it depends on the farmer's perspective as well. It might be that it's been a particularly bad year for for yourselves and on the farm, or it could be that you've bought in new stock that have potentially come in with a lot of, of say, bacteria and really increased infection pressure. So there's a lot of different, a lot of different potential causes for lameness being worse, kind of year on year. I would say. Okay. Uh, a question I'll direct to Tom. How do you feel uh, it could be done on the fashionability of lamb, given that it hasn't increased in popularity over the years in the way that we'd all hope? An example would be McDonald's don't serve any lamb, yet provide chicken, beef, and pork options. Oh, that's a that's an interesting one. Um, I would say in terms of growing the market, there is lots of the, growth, the growth in the market at the moment is about added value. So it's about um, slow cooked products. It's about shouting about whether it be shanks in a sauce. Um, and it's about the convenience aspects so of the retailer are trying to do lots of work on food ready for now, a meal center that's in 20 minutes. Um, that's where lots of retailers would over trade and they'll trade more of that than primary products. Coming actually back to primary, I would say the key here is that about trying to what farms can do is improve, ensure consistency. Sorry, improve is the wrong word. Ensure consistency of the product. So ensure that animals are obviously come back to in terms of the right spec. They've grown well in terms of their um, they haven't had checks and to ensure that actually the animal is presented in the right way. So the customer when the customer eats it, they are getting that right experience on a regular basis. OK. I have a question for Reg. Reg, um, when you're working in an academics uh, in Glasgow Vet School, how is the best? How do you find the best way in the future to connect with the average UK farmer? The latest academic findings. Oh, that's incredibly difficult. Um, to it's a short connect. answer, Reg. We're short of time. Um, uh, when I was in practice, the best way I could think of doing it was holding flock health clubs um, where we would have uh, discussions every six to six weeks, two months uh, about a topic chosen by farmers and the vet that was presenting that discussion would go away, do the research for it and was able to give a summary of that topic to farmers about all the race, recent research. So uh, engagement is probably best in small groups. OK, thank you. Uh, just conscious of time, so we'll have two last questions. Uh, Hannah, how do you treat cod when running an open flock buying replacements and store lambs? It's very difficult, but I think we know it's affecting about 20% of farms. So I think being cautious with where you're buying from where you're sourcing these these individuals from and making sure in your quarantine and you've got somewhere separate, you're not just putting everything with the main the main flocks. I think trying to make sure you can be as strict on quarantine and, and really keeping an eye for any region and buying from as, as trustworthy sources as possible. But it thank is you. difficult. <laughs> okay, thank you, Hannah. Uh, I'll ask a last question tonight to Jill. Jill, uh, what would be the ideal body score condition for, for lamb and thyme for, for a native hill breed? Uh, and it depends just exactly what type of using things you have, but in essence, he'll he'll you know, blacky use want to be no less than two at lamb and time between two and two and a half would be ideal. Okay, okay, thank you, Joel. Okay, well, I think that's concluded ten minutes of our questions, and uh, I would like to thank uh, all four of you for answering 
all the questions uh, so comprehensively. Uh, as you can see, our team in marketing have put up uh, our, our, our offer, which is uh, a win a free combi clamp on on uh, on uh, a feet and fertility offer. Now, normally at this point, when you're concluding and when you're wrapping up um, uh, this type of meeting, you usually hope that folk uh, have a safe journey home. Now, we don't have to do that on this occasion, as uh, everyone's based at home, but I would like to thank everyone for logging in and attending. Uh, I would like to thank the speakers. I would like to thank thank all our team at Harborough for putting this together. And um, I hope that uh, we can answer any further questions. And th this has actually been recorded. So you can link in and you can see it again. And there has been a number of questions, that have the extra questions that have come in. We will deal with them individually and try and give everyone an answer. And uh, Thank you to everyone for participating tonight. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.